God, who at many times and in many ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. For those who read and study the Bible, one truth holds steady. God has spoken. And in these last days, he speaks to us by his Son, Jesus the Christ, and the New Testament. The churches of Christ have sought to use this thought as our guiding principle, encouraging people to return to the scriptures and use them as our guide in matters of religion and faith. We're living in a time when many have been taught and believed that religious division among Christian churches is a good thing. After all, it gives us choices. But where do these choices come from? Why do they exist? What has been their results? Speaking of the last question, much division in doctrine, creed, beliefs has led us to believe in Christ to not just be divided in thought, beliefs, or worship, but sadly today we see the influence of Christianity fading as there exists at this time no clear standard to follow, no clear right or wrong, if you will. This is by no means the first time that God's people have been in such difficult and trying waters. The truths that led them back before will lead us back to unity and success once again. I've lived long enough to understand that given time, everything old is new again. If the writer to the Hebrews is to be taken seriously, then we must ask, where will we find these last words given to us by Christ, God's Son? It's clear that the Hebrew writer is speaking of the books of the Old Testament, when he speaks of times past and the prophets. For today we find these final words of Christ and his disciples, also known as apostles, revealed in the pages of the New Testament. The churches of Christ make an appeal to all of those who claim roots in the New Testament teaching of Christ and his apostles to make Christianity strong again in its influence and effects upon our world by uniting in the concept of being Christians only and allowing the New Testament to be our final authority in matters of faith, religion, and practice. That also includes matters of morality and the life that God wants us to live. Why would, you, why would we choose such things? Why? Are we looking for these things? Well, back in the Old Testament, the prophet Malachi, speaking on behalf of God in Malachi 2 and 10, says, Have we not all one Father? Had not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah had dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this have you done again, coveting, or covering rather, the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying, out insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. The prophet Malachi speaks of a time that the people of Israel had gone their own ways. They had divided up. Everyone was doing what they wanted to do, what they felt was good. All of these things, it they speaks of a, a strangeness here that, uh, that they had profaned the holiness of God and married the daughter of a strange God. 
new principles and ideas were being introduced into Israel and the people of God that had not existed before. And those same type of changes has happened again. Christianity and those who profess, profess to be the people of God do it in a strange and funny way. They have, in essence, married themselves to the daughter of a strange God. There have been principles and precepts, ideas and teachings and things brought into Christianity that did not exist in the beginning. That's why we plead to go back to the Bible, to be Christians only, to use the New Testament as our only guide in regards to matters of faith and religion as it applies to Christianity. In Revelation 4 and 11, we have a vision into heaven where a proclamation is made to God saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. We need to understand that God is the creator of all things. He has given us His Word, His covenant, as He did to those of the Old Testament, so He has in the period of the New Testament to lead us and guide us. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3 and 6, speaking about God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, that being in reference to the old law, but of the Spirit. You know, if we're going to be ministers of Christ, and if we're going to speak about the New Testament of Christ's blood, then shouldn't we be following the New Testament and the Word of God as it was given us? Shouldn't we be worshiping God in spirit and in truth according to the precepts and concepts that were given to us so that we might be those able ministers? Ministers have a great responsibility to preach the truth and lead people in paths that God wants His people to follow. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 13, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. If we want to be Christians as defined in the New Testament, then shouldn't we stand fast and hold the traditions which have been taught by the New Testament, shouldn't we shed those traditions and things that we can find no reference to in the Scriptures that only divide us and weaken Christianity? The Word of God is powerful. In the 33rd Psalm, beginning in verse 6, it says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea together as a heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Very powerful verse there at last in 33 and 9 in encouraging us in today's world calling ourselves Christians, shouldn't we allow God to speak? And shouldn't we do the things that God has told us? Shouldn't He command and those commandments stand fast in the houses that call themselves the places of His worship? He has spoken again to us through His Son and those who heard Him in the New Testament. That's what the Hebrew writer tells us. In Hebrews 2 and 1, in beginning there, the writer encourages Christians to be very careful how they handle the Word of God. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, 
that's talking about the Old Testament, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Let me ask a question here. Why are people today being led to believe that the New Testament has nothing to say of value to our world, to our people, to those who worship with us? Why is the world turning away from the very Word of God? Why is it that people believe that the New Testament especially has nothing to say today? Or is it rather that the people of today have no desire to hear what the New Testament has to say as to their life and lifestyles? I believe the latter to be true. You know, it's not that the New Testament doesn't have something to say. It's just people's hearts today are very hard and hardened and they're not interested in hearing. One very important thing to note is that whether we're speaking of God's dealing with the people of Israel, the patriarchs of old, or in Jesus' day or today, the Bible, both Old and New Testament, is about regulation. It is the control of excess, temptation, and yes, a word that we don't like to hear, sin. Turning our backs on the teachings of the Bible will not change what it has to say. It didn't change it then, and it most certainly will not change it today. Peter said in 2 Peter 3 and 15, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, and which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, under their own destruction. That's kind of interesting, because Peter talks about the beloved brother Paul, and his writing, yes, sometimes things which are hard to be understood, and sometimes people struggled with those things. But he also said, as they do the other scriptures, it's not just the things that are hard to understand, but there are many things that are clearly understood. We know what the Bible is saying, but we twist and rest the scriptures. We torture the things that are being taught so as to not offend anyone. That's a sad truth of Christianity today. Christianity today, in many ways, has become a wrestling match with the Word of God, twisting the scriptures to suit our own means and ignoring the ones that we don't want to listen to. The word rest there in the book of 2 Peter 3.16 means to wrench, to torture, or to pervert. It's a sad truth that in many ways Christianity today has perverted the true, the true teachings of the Scriptures so as to make those who are guilty of the sins acknowledged there feel comfortable with their lifestyle. You know, we need to be Christians as defined in the Scriptures. In Acts 11, verse 25, we find that Barnabas departed to Tarsus, and he went seeking Saul, who would later be known as the Apostle Paul. In verse 26, it says, And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. 
And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. All of these people assembled together, learning what the Word of God had to say. And in the process of time, we find, according to Acts 11, 26, the first time that this title Christian is used. All of these people from different backgrounds, different places, were just called Christians. In Acts 26, the Apostle Paul is speaking before King Agrippa, and he asks him a question in Acts 26 and 27. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Agrippa understood that if he gave in to the things that the Apostle Paul was teaching, that he would be a Christian. Later, Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, beginning in verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he's evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God. On this behalf. For those who stand with Christ in the New Testament, who desire to be Christians only, who want to have the Bible, the New Testament especially, as the only guide leading them into this Christian faith and truth, there's been much used to block the way of truth and the life that we should live. Sometimes we're called to even suffer because we take a firm stand upon the things of the Scriptures, looking for what thus the Lord hath said, wanting to know what the New Testament has to say. James says in James 1.25, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Let's use the example, the encouragement that James gives us in James 1.25 to look into the New Testament, that perfect law of liberty delivering us from our sins and from the law-keeping of the Old Testament, not being a forgetful here, but if we want to be blessed, do the things that are taught therein. Concerning the New Testament and the things that we know today as the New Testament, Peter says in 2 Peter 1 and 3, According as his divine power hath given to us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. God, through the Holy Spirit and through the New Testament, has given to us all things that not only pertain to this life and living a life satisfactory before God, but coming to that point of godliness itself through that knowledge contained in the Scriptures. So it's so sad that people today are being led away from the truths of the New Testament, not wanting to seek or challenging, wrestling with the very things that define a life well lived before God and one of godliness. The world today wants, wants. They feed the things of the flesh that they want, even in matters of faith and religion. 
Much has been brought in to satisfy those who are slow to change, if at all. Friends, this is not repentance. Wrestling the scriptures to satisfy the wants of individuals and the lifestyles separate and apart from what God calls holiness is not repentance. It's much like the Apostle Paul in Athens of old in Acts 17. There he found an, an inscription to the unknown God. There was much teaching going on about the various gods, but when Paul speaks concerning the God that they did not know, he says in Acts 17, 28, For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own prophets have said. For we are also his offspring. For such then, as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. Religion is not about our skill. It's not about changing things for our moods or our ways. Idolatry of old was creating God in the image of man rather than accepting the fact that man was made in the image of God. Sadly today, a lot of Christianity, or what calls itself Christianity, is trying to remake the scriptures in the image of man instead of allowing God to lead us into his ways. As Paul spoke to the people at Athens, he says, The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in the which he would judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. As sure as Christ raised from the dead, God plans to judge the world. And he plans to use as basis of that judgment the very word which is taught that we ought to give what the Hebrew writer says a more earnest heed to. Jesus said in John twelve forty eight, beginning there, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me commandment, what I should say, what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. We ought to be giving heed to the things which Jesus had said. In Matthew 15, the scribes and Pharisees came to Jesus with the question, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? You know, in Jesus' day, a lot of religion was about the traditions and the customs that had been brought in rather than what the Bible says. One of the things that put Jesus at odds with the scribes and Pharisees was his insistence upon following the things God had said rather than traditions which had been made and created. He would say in Matthew 15, 9, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. When we teach for doctrine the commandments that come from men, we do so worshiping God in vain. And what that word means is to no purpose or to do it fruitlessly or it bears no fruit. Traditions and the customs of men, if they were not given by God and if it contradicts the things of God, is fruitless. Do you want your life to have meaning and purpose? Do you want to help bring the world of Christianity back to a very powerful position in the world? Do you want it to reach beyond this life into an eternity with God? 
then why not make this the day that you and your family make a decision to know more about God's plan for your lives? Why not seek out the Church of Christ in your community and attend one of the worship times or Bible studies? God's salvation is truly worth finding and knowing. May God bless and keep you in His grace as we walk together in His truth. And remember, as always, the churches of Christ salute you.